everybody for being here. Uh, uh, good, morning. good morning. And um, uh, welcome to uh, to Albany. And uh, uh, welcome to to this uh, uh, 42nd annual Black Hispanic Legislative Caucus Weekend. Uh, I'm State Senator Bill Perkins. I represent the 30th Senatorial District, which uh, includes the, uh, the Harlem community, uh, the Upper West Side, Morningside Heights community, El Barrio, East Harlem. And I'm honored to uh, uh, be here today uh, to open up uh, this extraordinary workshop. And uh, we are, have an exciting uh, panel. Uh, and we are looking forward to your participation. So uh, this is not a, a listening opportunity. Uh, and it's an opportunity for you and, and the panel to discuss uh, what we believe are important uh, agendas related to uh, immigration reform. And then uh, uh, you also are going to be uh, uh, hopefully uh, mo mo mobilized to participate in this uh, immigration reform movement, particularly as it uh, requires state legislation uh, and, uh, and your involvement. And uh, we want to uh, make sure that uh, you have an opportunity to, to sign a petition uh, that will be passed around that relates to a bill that I'm sponsoring uh, to pass the New York State Dream Act uh, sponsored uh, by yours truly, Senator Bill Perkins, and my staff uh, will be handing this out for you to uh, to uh, sign. I also want to uh, 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 share with you uh, that uh, Governor Cuomo has announced the, the creation of the New York State Office of New Americans. Uh, in his uh, State of the State message last year, New Americans bring unique talent and energy to our state and the Office for New Americans will ensure that they have every opportunity, every opportunity to participate in New York's civic and economic life. The Office has created a network of neighborhood-based organizations that provide English language, citizenship, and entrepreneurship services. These organizations are supported by a cadre of expert immigration lawyers and entrepreneur trainers and to make sure that you understood how serious the governor is about this, uh, he has sent to you uh, to be a part of this uh, uh, workshop, uh, and he's with us already, he was here earlier as a matter of fact, the Secretary of the State of New York for the Department of State, a good friend and, and advocate, Cesar A. Perales, and I think that you will find him to be very receptive and and uh, available, or that office will be very receptive and available to the kind of issues that we're concerned about today. And so uh, I wanted to also now begin uh, by asking the panelists uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Dan Barro. I'm a journalist from Senegal. I have a radio show for the past 20 years in New York, uh, geared to the African immigrants here, and I'm also a reporter for a news organization back home in Senegal. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Senator Perkins. My name is uh, Bakri Tanya. I am a case manager and policy advocate at African Services Committee, uh, leading African organization in, uh, in the U.S. I am also member of the board of the New York Im Immigration Coalition, uh, which, is, which is a coalition of more than 200 organizations coordinating the campaign for comprehensive immigration reform in New York State. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, my name is Rosine Zaman, I'm the campaign organizer for the New York State Youth Leadership Council. So we are um, the only undocumented youth-led nonprofit organization in New York State. And we started the New York State Dream Act with Senator Perkins in early 2011. And I'm Jackie Vimo, I'm the director of advocacy at the New York Immigration So Steering Committee member of the New York State Dream Coalition, along with Rosine, um, and we've been fighting with Senator Perkins to pass New York State Dream legislation. I'm Tiana stowers um the executive director of the Black Institute. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Alden Nesbitt. I'm a member of the Black Institute and co-chair of the International Youth Association. Good morning, Bishop Orlando Finlater. I'm the chairman of Churches United to Save and Heal Kosh an advocacy group that fights for comprehensive immigration reform um, for people from the Caribbean and Africa. I am Mikhail Critchlow, also from the International Youth Association. 
Good morning, my name is Alfred Placeris. I'm an attorney and I'm a legal director for Casa Pueblo and president of the New York State Federation of Hispanic Chambers of Commerce. Let me just say, this is Bertha Lewis and she will tell you how, how the program will go. And uh, my name is Bertha Lewis, some of you know me. Um, I was a former uh, director of ACORN and now I'm the president and founder of the Black Institute. We are an action tank, a think tank that takes action. Okay. And um, our campaign over the past several years has been about making sure that black immigrants from South America, the Caribbean, Africa are included in the comprehensive immigration reform uh, movement. Um, we will be having first uh, a short video um, about Caribbean dreamers and Caribbean professionals that have been recruited here and then um, we will, after that video, we'll have a presentation um, from the New York Immigration Coalition and uh, uh, the New York State Youth Council. And once those two visuals are, um, are done, then we will have our panelists move up and each will give a short one, two minute uh, presentation. You, without further ado, if the lights go down, we will start with our first video. There's a dirty little secret in this country of where education and immigration cross. And also a dirty little secret about how black immigrants have been shut out and not spoken of when we talk about a national comprehensive immigration debate. I was sitting in my office in downtown Brooklyn one day when I got a call from an attorney and he said, Bertha, you need to come over here right away. I got a group of women here and you've got to hear what has happened to them. I walked into his office and there was a group of eight women, all black, all from the Caribbean. And they began to tell me a story about broken promises. Teachers with advanced degrees, the cream of the crop in the Caribbean, recruited to work in the New York City public school system, promised a path to citizenship, promised um, help with further education, promised support for their families, promised uh, all sorts of things to get them to come here. And when I met up with them, it was 10 years later. And they were still waiting for their green card. And the person who was doing the recruiting, he actually was at, at the recruiting office, um, Sam. He came down to the back of the room where I was sitting and asked me, he said, well, come on, let, let me um, you know, talk with you. Let's hear what um, qualifications you had. So I said, well, okay, I have two bachelors and a master's, uh, 20 years experience teaching. And he was like, what? We need you. You have to come. He said, what happened? You, you have family? I said, yes, I have three children. At that point, he took all my information and he filled in everything that I had to do. I didn't go to any other person. His thing was, he saw my quality. He heard what I said I was doing and he wanted me to come. And he would provide everything that my children would need. We were promised, um, one, a better life, two, that after the, the most we would have been serving the city was five years and then we would become officially residents and everything would have worked out unfortunately when i came we were put up at the marriott hotel fine wonderful no food um you had to find your own food they just give you somewhere to sleep then having to attend a job fair to find a school was the second shock because I thought you recruited me, you knew exactly where I was going. But then we were told we had to attend a job fair to find schools on our own. And that tale of broken promises, of not folks coming here illegally or jumping over fences, was really something. And I'm like, who else knows about this? 
because it was shocking to me that these professionals would be treated in such a manner. First meeting that I had was with eight of them. I asked them to bring other folks that had the same problem with them. The second meeting, they brought 40 people. Then I said, well, maybe, are you willing to fight? Are you willing to organize? Are you willing to come out of the shadows? They said, yes. The third meeting was 90 people. And the fourth meeting, which we planned, hoping to just get 100. We had over 225 teachers come that were fired up and ready to fight. And we won some things in that fight. We got rid of principals having to write a letter extending their visa. We actually did, uh, by becoming visible, actually dealt with our Congress people and dealt with Washington DC and connected with other uh, groups who of international teachers, those from the Philippines and from all over the world. We formed the Association of International Educators because this is a problem throughout this country. My message to them is to just give us the respect because we made a big difference in the education system in New York City. We, many of us have went into SOAR schools, like I'm one who went into SOAR school, and we've moved that school from SOAR to being one of the top schools. Because many of us, our kids are pages, as they still call it, and they've, they've been left in the woods. Who from the Board of Ed care about our kids? Nobody. Again, one of their issues was that their children were aging out. When you come with a parent, that was recruited here again. And if you don't get your green card by the time um, that you are 21, you are considered aged out. That means you are no longer in status. You must return to the country that you've been away from. Remember, for 10 years, a lot of the children that came with these teachers came as young children, attended school here, went to college here. You cannot drive, you cannot get proper ID. You could be a fabulous student, but you cannot get financial aid. I came to New York when I was 16 years old. I came with my mother from Trinidad and Tobago. She was recruited by the Department of Education to be a teacher in the public school system here in New York. My mother is still enrolled, uh, still currently a teacher in New York City. I was able to go to school, I was able to go to college. I got a bachelor's degree in architectural technology. However, I'm unable to use that degree because I am aged out. It's difficult coming from a single income household because my mother is the only one allowed to work as a teacher. And with a teacher's salary, it's very difficult to send me to college. I can only imagine how difficult it is for other teachers who have multiple children at home. Because I aged out, I wasn't able to get work in the field of architecture. However, while I was in school, I did have an internship, one internship. I came here in 2001 with my mother, my brother, and my sister. I was 11 years old, my brother was 18, and my sister was 16 years of age. My mother came here um, to teach special education in the New York City Department of Education. My mother wanted to come to the United States because my sister needed to go to school. She wanted to go to school for culinary arts. My brother wanted to go to school for architecture and I had health issues. I suffered with severe migraines at a young age and in Trinidad the, the medical is not as advanced as it is in um, America. So one of our goals was to help me with my medical while I also wanted to go to school and learn um, how to be a psychologist, a criminal psychologist in the New York City school system. We came here in 2001, that was 11 years ago. My mother expected um, a place for us to stay, not the entire time, but temporary, which we did not get. We stayed in the attic, um, in my aunt's attic, the four of us, for three years. My mother expected um, permanent residency, eventually green cards, which we still do not have. 
currently my brother is a green card holder because he got married my sister is 28 years of age she is undocumented with a degree in um, culinary arts business management I went to public school in the United States. I went to middle school. I graduated high school with a Regents Diploma and I spent four years in college until I realized I aged out. I am now 21 years of age. When I was 21, I got a letter from the USCIS stating that my status is, is being revoked. Um, I tried to apply for a student visa at that time, but it was already too late. So at the age of 21, I realized I was aged out. I got a letter from school saying that I could no longer participate in um, you know, Kingsborough Community College because my status changed. Um, I also have no IDs. I don't have identification. And the, the last 11 years has been a, a struggle and a fight for me and my family. My sister who has an eight year old son a degree in business management and she can't do anything. She is very depressed about it. She She's one of the reasons why I'm fighting so hard because I know that she wants to support her son and she can't. I came to the US at the age of eight years old in 2003 with my mother, my father, and my little sister. I was one of the lucky few who came at such an early age that I was able to receive my green card. My mother, who came out to teach English, is teaching right now in Grover Cleveland High School. She's teaching 9th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade English. She's been working in the system for about 9 years now. Unlike my peers, I have opportunities to get scholarships, and this is only because I received my green card after a 7-year process which was very tireless and relenting. My, when, my, when my parents and I first got into the mill, we were very ecstatic because this was a huge weight off each and every one of our backs, you know. I was lucky enough to receive permanent residency and I, th I believe that this benefit should be passed on to each and every one of my peers in the International Youth Association. We all deserve a chance to pursue our dreams and the promises that were made to us upon entering this country. I am applicable for DACA. Deferred action because I entered the country before I was 16 because I graduated from high school I did fill out my application, but my application cannot be sent in because I do not have the $465 to pay for the application um, my mother is the sole provider of Not just me, but of, for my brother my sister my nephew and herself So it's hard for her to find $465 to pay for DACA. There are family stresses that can become so bad that people either leave, give up, and discuss, or uh, some families have been driven uh, to despair in that there have been a number of suicides, a number of suicides and those who take the lives of their family uh, because this issue is so, so serious. For a lot of people, it seems hopeless. It seems hopeless to, to fight a system that seems like the purpose of the system is to basically make it harder for immigrants to get permanent residency. Young people in this country who want to be under the DREAM Act, but the DREAM Act doesn't include Caribbean dreamers because of the age restrictions and because people just don't think about black immigrants or Caribbeans that come, or black immigrants that come from South America and all in Central America. They're not just through the Caribbean or from Africa. So these children of these teachers, they have their dreams deferred because they are black, invisible, but they came here documented. So we need to fight also. And those dependents, those children of the teachers, they formed an organization called TIA, the International Youth Association. We need green cards. Me and my association, we need permanent residency. We are children of recruited professionals and we feel that if the United States needed our parents to teach here and they asked our parents to come over here with their families that the least that they could give us is citizenship. The least that they could give us is a pathway to permanent residency so that we can live life comfortably 
in the in the United States. All of us, all of us, we went to school. A lot of we're just a highly educated group of kids, and it, it's it's really sad that no one really hears our and no one. There's not a lot of people out there supporting us because we've sort of gotten lost in the immigration debate. It's been challenging organizing, uh, just organizing the youth to come together and and really fight to get the children of teachers, their, their green cards and the permanent residency that they were promised. It's been challenging because so many of them are afraid, so many of them don't want to come out of the shadows and actually stand up and, and make a loud voice and tell the politicians this is what we were promised, this is what we need. Because I'm undocumented, I have no identification, I have no driver's license, which is difficult because just moving around New York City you know, sometimes the cops stop you, you need identification. It's just to get in a lot of buildings in New York City, you need identification. So, you know, not having, identifi not having an ID card is, is a problem. There's also a lot of other things that affect us also, like stop and frisk and secure communities. Now, because, because in the immigration debate, when people hear the phrase immigration or immigrants, the first thing they think of is Hispanic people. Not much people recognize us black immigrants as being immigrants. So in our communities, we look at us as African American, where stop and frisk affects 90% of the minorities in, in the United States. So now we're being looked at as African Americans who are being discriminated against by, being, by stop and frisk. Now there's another policy in New York City called Secure Communities that personally affects my um, association. It affects us because Secure Communities allows the police to take in undocumented youth who do, who do not have um, their IDs or who do not have um, identification on them so and fingerprint them and basically tag them as undocumented immigrants and basically discriminate. Basically the police are being allowed to discriminate not just against African Americans or minorities in communities but now they can discriminate against um, immigrants in the communities and take us in and report us to ICE and this is the wrong way to use secure communities and this is one of the many things that are, that are affecting my association. So emotionally it is stressful, everything is stressful. Fighting for something that was promised to us is stressful. Fighting to be normal, fighting to have status is depressing and it hurts. It hurts to have to, to do things that others don't, didn't have to do. It hurts to have to tell people that I have a status that that is basically is basically derogatory. It, it, it makes me feel like I am less of a person in America because of my status. And this needs to be changed. We need permanent residency. Two campaigns on one path. Two sides of the same coin the Broken Promises campaign and the Dream Deferred campaign. Both of these campaigns illustrating the dirty little secret of black immigration where immigration and education cross in this country. How did we get here? And I, and I think that you know, the presentation that we just saw from the Black Institute you know, is, a, um, is a good frame some of the big issues. In 1986 was the last time that we had immigration reform. I'm going to just say really quickly how we're in this situation. Uh, it was the first time we had a situation then that there were millions of immigrants who were undocumented. And in 86, under President Reagan, uh, um, they uh, created a bill that would allow people to adjust their stat status. Since 1980, the problem with that bill, however, was that it didn't fix the problem. It put a Band-Aid on it. It did not create pa its sufficient paths for future flows, what we call future generations, to be able to come into this country legally. So, um, you know, while it did allow many people in 1986 to fit their situation, here we are, you know, many decades later in 2013, and now we're back in the same situation with 11 million undocumented people living in the United States. Okay, so who is to blame? Partially, this is a federal problem, right? This is Washington's inaction, right? And, and so we have people here, and again, they, I think that they very eloquently discuss some of the challenges people have, living in fear, living with identity, without identity documents, living without access to basic things. 
And so what can we do here in New York is the question. Because people keep on saying this is a federal issue. There's nothing that the states can do. There are things that the states can do. And, and one of those things is that we can pass legislation to allow undocumented youth to have access to the same educational opportunities as their peers. Right now, undocumented students in New York don't have access to any form of publicly funded financial assistance at the state or federal level to help them pursue their dreams of higher education. Not only that, they cannot actually apply for um, loans, right? So, I mean, this is really a situation. I'm a professor at the City College of New York, and I can tell you some of my best students will come to me and they'll say, Professor, I have to drop out. Why? You're at the top of your class. You're one of the best students. I'm working three jobs. You know, I, I can't work full time, pay tuition, and do this. And, and you know, and it just and I, you know, and I, and you know what else? I'm undocumented, so I have no other choice. And I, I see it happen semester after semester. Um, so you know, um, we I think it's important that that we see this as a moral issue. Yes. This is just I mean, the, the first why should we pass legislation here in New York? Because it's the right thing to do, right? Um, it is unacceptable for young people to be deprived of the opportunity to pursue their dreams. We are New Yorkers. We believe in fairness. We believe in equality. It is just wrong. Um, it's also inconsistent from a state policy perspective to fund undocumented youth education until 18 and then say, guess what? Game over. You know, you've been part of this community. You've been sitting in, in school chairs and next to the desks of your peers. Some people don't even really find out they're undocumented until they become much older. So they've actually been living and they have no idea that suddenly their whole lives have been a lie. Um, and I think it's also important to know, even if federal immigration reform is passed, we will still almost certainly need to pass New York State Dream legislation here in New York. So when people say, we shouldn't do anything, right, the, the feds are going to take care of it, that's not true. Thirteen states have passed in-state tuition. California, Texas, New York, Utah, Washington, Oklahoma, Illinois, Kansas, New Mexico, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Maryland, Connecticut. So all of these allow undocumented youth to apply as the residents that they are of New York State and not as out-of-state residents to have a lower tuition rate. Um, however, we have not allowed access to financial assistance. Um, Texas, this is what I, what I love to tell people, Texas has been doing this since 2001 under Governor Rick Perry for 12 years. How many people here think it's okay that we are 12 years behind Texas? No, no, no one. All right, good, good. If anyone was going to raise their hand, we can have a conversation about that later. Um, um, so that allowed people, undocumented youth in Texas to apply for state financial uh, assistance programs and have private scholarships. Um, New Mexico did the same thing uh, in 2005. Illinois passed similar legislation in 2011, although slightly less and actually not enough. Um, California did the same thing um, in 2011. So the question is, um, what are we going to do here now in New York State to make sure that we don't stand fall that far behind Texas and that we don't make young people have to wait for their dreams to come true? It is unacceptable, and I think that um, we've actually had a really strong campaign that's been led by undocumented youth themselves. Um, and Rosine can talk a little bit about what we've done here in New York and what you guys can do here in the audience before um, we leave to make sure that this dream becomes a reality. I was meeting with um, the first members of the first Asian undocumented youth-led organization in New York, and you know, the group is comprised of Asian undocumented youth who have been relegated to the shadows, very much like black undocumented immigrant youth, uh, to introduce our bill to give undocumented youth financial aid. Because of Senator Perkins' leadership and courage, we can actually sit here and have, you know, realistically think and believe that undocumented youth can realistically get financial aid by the end of this year. Anyways, um. I was meeting with one of the members, and she was telling me her story. Um, she's a 21-year-old 20 -year um, who migrated to the US when she was eight years old. She lives with just her 12-year-old sister because it was easier for her parents, who are also undocumented, to get jobs in different states. Um, she works at a restaurant. She, her work schedule, she was telling me about it, she begins work at 10 AM in the morning and leaves the restaurant at 11 p.m. at night. Um, she isn't allowed to sit down even one time at her restaurant, right? So she's at, um, she's on her feet basically 13 hours a day. When she gets home, she checks her sister's schoolwork, and she cooks for both of them. She's only able to take one class at a time because that's all she can afford because she has to worry about things like rent and food as a 21-year-old. When I asked her, um, how, if this was how she, she, would, she imagined her life would turn out, she said, no, of course not, but she was doing everything she could to survive. 
And when I think about stories like that, I am reminded of that, you know, the enormous significance of, about the, of the New York State Dream Act. But of course, you know, I'm not just here to talk about undocumented immigrants in the third person. I can also share my own story as an undocumented immigrant youth. Um, I came to the U.S. when I was two years old. My dad was involved in a political party um, to the point where um, he was violently targeted by the opposing political party, um, and I guess to the point where acid was actually thrown on him. We felt like it was a very unsafe situation, so we came to the U.S. Um, we attempted to apply for political asylum. Um, unfortunately, we had the really bad fortune of being scammed by an immigration attorney who not only took our money, but he threatened to call immigration agents on us, right? And my parents, so they were so naturally afraid of going back, you know, facing the same political situation in my home country, and you know, so they said nothing about it. They didn't report it to police officials or anything. And this is, um, by the time I guess all of this was over, our visas had expired and we became undocumented this way. I guess the first time um, I learned about my status, but I knew I couldn't work. I was applying to jobs all over the place at that time. I had got, you know, I had done a few job offers, but I couldn't take them because of my immigration status. I couldn't fill out the I-9. At a certain point, you know, I was just so humiliated after applying to jobs and not being able to take them. I want to focus on 2010 for a moment because that was a very important year for the undocumented immigrant youth movement. Um, because there was a bill called the Dream Act. Um, that, that's a bill in Congress. It's a, how, how old is it by this time? 2001 is the first one. Yeah. So. And also 13 years old. Yeah. So it's 13 years old at this point. It hasn't ever passed. Um, so the Dream Act. Um, there was talk about that the, the federal Dream Act could be put up for a vote. So youth, undocumented youth across the country were organizing for the bill. Um, so there was a 40-day hunger strike in Texas. There was a hunger strike in North Carolina. And in New York City, um, the Youth Leadership Council, we had a hunger strike in front of Senator Schumer's office. Um, but we all know how that chapter ended. Um, it passed the House of Representatives for the very first time in history, but it failed the Senate for five votes. So something that would have changed our lives completely, all, you know, it failed for five votes. Um, and I guess I want to... I want to focus on the New York State Dream Act. I know there's other pan panelists here, so I want to get fast about it. Um, but in New York, we had, you know, we had devoted so many resources and energy towards fighting for the federal Dream Act. I mentioned we did the hunger strike. Four of our members, they walked 250 miles on foot from New York City to Washington, D.C. to advocate for that bill. We were willing to do anything for it. You know, when it failed, we didn't know what we were going to do with our lives. You know, should we wait for Washington to pick it up again? Um, so we, in early 2011, I remember, we were sitting in a really small room, really devastated. Um, we printed out a copy of the Federal Dream Act, literally went through it line by line, underlined the, cons you know, the parts of it that we liked, and then we came up with the New York State Dream Act that way. Um, the original New York Dream Act, um, there were four components of it that we had wanted. There was um, financial aid, there was driver's licenses, health insurance, and work permits for undocumented youth in New York. The idea behind it really was that um, we would become citizens of New York State somehow. Um, I know it's a very ambitious proposal, but when, when you're undocumented, you don't have the luxury of not hoping, I would say. Um, so as I, I was mentioning before, you know, we didn't know how to start a bill at all. This is a bunch of like 20, 21 year olds I'm talking about, like coming up with this bill and figuring out how to go out to go to Albany and figure out how to introduce a bill. But we. You know, we went to many members of the New York State Legislature with our proposal, and as I mentioned, no one wanted to touch our bill. They said it was doomed to fail. The only person in the Senate who was willing to pick our, up our bill was Senator Bill Perkins at the end of the day. We are so tremendously grateful for that. So um, because we didn't get enough support at the end of the day for all those four components, we just we decided to pare it down to just financial aid, which is still a really important, right? Um, and last year, you know, um, so we advocated for the bill heavily. Um, we, I know some of Governor Cuomo's folks are here too, but um, some of our members, um, they engaged in a civil disobedience in front of Governor Cuomo's office because we need the governor's support. undocumented youth, um, you know, you really have to think about it because when you're undocumented and you get arrested, you know, you just don't have to deal with the, N the NYPD, right? You face the, you know, like there's a potential of actually getting deported at the end of the day. So it's crazy to get arrested and be willing to you know, participate in such an action. 
Um, we also walked to Albany. Senator Bill Perkins walked with us for a little bit of that. Um, <laughs> just across the street. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's more than that. I just kicked it off. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I think we had enough co-sponsors to pass it in the assembly last year, but not enough in the Senate because New York State Senate was Republican controlled last year. Um, so it didn't pass either chamber at the end of the day. Um, so essentially I'm here today to vouch on behalf of my members who are some of the most intelligent, kind, compassionate, and promising youth that I know. <coughs> I think what we're asking for at the end of the day is access to state financial aid because we want a chance of, of developing our future and our lives. Um, this is about like the state, the country, you, you know, penalized to such an extent, right? over things you didn't have control over, and neither did our parents at the end of the day, right? When we think about it, broadly speaking, about US foreign immigrant you know, policies, um, they really didn't have a choice at all. Um, so our laws really need to be dynamic to reflect people's everyday situations, and that's why we're asking you to pass the New York State Dream Act this year. <laughs> not anywhere near as eloquent, but I just want to make it really clear that it is unacceptable for us to not pass the DREAM Act this year. Yes. And that everyone in this room can play a part in supporting this effort. Um, you can uh, sign the petition that Senator Perkins uh, is, is circulating around. You can do something really simple like join our Facebook group. It's just NYS DREAM and Facebook. Um, you can contact me or Razine, um, and you can, if you are an elected official, which some of you in this room are, you can contact your peers if you haven't already supported this and, and ask them for their support. We can uh, contact Governor Cuomo and ask him for his support and members of the, um, you know, the Assembly and the Senate that haven't signed on yet. So I think that if you get anything out of today, um, and, and it is really that all of us have an obligation, do one thing. Pick up the phone, yes. make that call, and say and, and speak to anyone and everyone you know who has the power to move this legislation and say, this has to happen this year. We cannot be 10 years behind Texas. We also just can't be even one day behind allowing people like Razine and other members of our state to be deprived of basic equality. So, thank you. Thank you very much for that, that wonderful presentation. Uh, Bishop, you're next, but I just want to take a moment to recognize uh, Mr. Jose de Villa, who's with the Hispanic Federation. He's actually the Vice President for Policy and Government Relations. Please give him a round of applause for the wonderful work that he and your organization has been doing. And then I'm also especially honored to uh, ask uh, Council Member Melissa Mark Viverito to please come forward. I, I know that you didn't come to speak, but it would be uh, wrong for me to allow you to leave without saying hello, especially since I know how strongly supportive you are of this movement. And so please, uh, if you will, uh, take a moment to, to say hello to the folks. Councilwoman Melissa Mark Vivo uh, one, one of the outstanding uh, uh, progressive council members, heroic council members that we have in, in New York City government, someone that we want to make sure. Uh, continues to be supported and her uh, work especially uh, because it's so 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 important to all of us uh, uh, thank you good afternoon everybody good morning uh, and I really want to thank all the panelists for for their uh, presentations and obviously the great partnership of Senator Perkins in being a lead sponsor of this bill and being a partner on this issue of, of immigration reform that is so desperately needed uh, and obviously it's an issue that I'm very passionate about it as a city council member I am a member of the Black Latino Asian Caucus I'm also co-chair of the Progressive Caucus that is about uh, three years old and will continue to grow uh, hopefully in the next term. But we have made uh, in New York City we have great advocates like the New York Immigration Coalition, uh, Make the Road and other groups that are really setting the pace uh, at a local level about what we can do to continue to make New York City and to continue to make New York State uh, a wonderful place for our immigrants, a welcoming place for uh, our immigrants, a city and a state that continues to validate the contributions that immigrants make each and every day, and not to criminalize uh, those that come here seeking for work and seeking better opportunities. And so, you know, we've been doing a lot of work at the local level. We have passed legislation in the New York City Council, which I've been the lead sponsor of. Uh, to really try to limit the cooperation between the Department of Corrections and immigration agents which are based in Rikers Island uh, as a way of really trying to protect, again, those that are um, 
being accused of crimes, not they have not been found guilty of crimes. These are people that are going to Rikers Island and being accused of low-level offenses, and because of immigration agents being in Rikers Island, information is being shared and people are being funneled into the deportation system. So we put a, a law in place to limit that level of cooperation, and we're in the process of passing similar legislation when it comes to the NYPD. Uh, now with secure communities in place, uh, we know that, again, when people are arrested, sent to the precinct, and fingerprints are being shared uh, with the federal government, there's the opportunity there, again, uh, to round people up and to send them into and funnel them into the immigration, uh, into the deportation system. So, again, we're doing a lot of work, but obviously all of those successes don't come about unless there is the mobilization and the energy on the ground. So that is why the advocates and mobilization and organizing continues to be vital to passing laws and legislation and policies that are humane and that are just. So I want to thank everyone that is here. There's a lot of work yet to be done. Uh, but the conversation continues, and hopefully the energy will continue outside of this room. So thank you all for what you do. But briefly, let me thank the senator, Senator Perkins, for um, leading this charge. The immigration system of the United States is broken. Anyone with half a brain knows that. And Washington is broken. And this is really a federal issue, and because the federal government refuses or just can't get their act together, then the states have to do something. So when we think that we educate children, students here from K to 12, and they say to them, you can't go to college, again, frankly, that makes absolutely no sense. And so I'm here simply to join my voice to say, we must do everything we can to pass the New York State Dream Act this year. When we look at these talented young people who are sitting here, um, somehow they went to college and can't work to contribute to the state of New York or the U.S., it makes no sense. Now, I'm going to say something that no one wants to say. The immigration policy of the United States is racist. No one wants to say that. Let me give you one example and then I want to finish. Every year, as, as, a, as a leader, of course, we invite a pastor from Africa or the Caribbean to come here, preach in our churches, get some resources to go back home. I've been doing it for 15 years. And every year, I send a letter of invitation. They take that to the U.S. Embassy. They get a six-month entry visa. They come, they preach, and they go back home. About four years ago, one of my colleagues said, why don't you invite a pastor from Australia? Um, you know, he has something to offer. I'm like, I have no interest. But he convinced me that he would be a blessing to the churches here. So I sent a letter to Australia. He took the same letter to the U.S. Embassy in Australia, got a 10-year multiple entry visa. Stop. If you come from Africa or the Caribbean, you get a six-month one entry. You come from Australia, you get a 10-year multiple entry. The immigration system is racist, and we have to address it. And so while Washington worked to get their act together, we must work with legislators um, to make sure that it passed in New York. And let me encourage the young folks. I was once undocumented. Came here from the Republic of Panama at 12 years old. After six months, my visa expires, and I was one undo undocumented. I'm now a U.S. citizen, so if you stay the course and we support you, it's going to pass in the city of New York, and eventually it will pass in Washington. So don't give up. I'm encouraged by your testimony and by your commitment. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Senator per, uh, Perkins, again, my name is Bakari Tanja from African Service Committee. Uh, we are very glad uh, to be here uh, because what you have done is not just about, uh, you know, the policy regarding the DREAM Act. You have given us, you know, the opportunity to show the diversity in the debate for comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, the DREAM Act uh, what we just uh, heard today, it is very touching, it is very moving. Uh, from the broken promises to uh, the story uh, Rezina shared uh, you know, with us. Uh, I think about you know, the, the Dream Act, if, if we look into it on the uh, justice perspective, uh, you cannot punish someone for the wrongdoings of somebody else. So if we apply that, this is the clear case of the dreamers. <coughs> they did not commit any wrongdoing. So how can you punish uh, you know, people who have not done anything wrong? 
And what they are try, trying to do is to pursue their goals, the American dream. The American dream is called the American dream, but it is just a human dream. Anyone has the aspiration to, 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 to improve his or her own life and also to contribute to the economic development and the growth of America. Because the uh, U.S. is appealing to workers from, from abroad. Every year we have more than 50,000 visa granted uh, 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 you know, uh, for, 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 for applications. So when we have young people who are here, who are highly qualified, we cannot, we, we cannot uh, 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 ignore them. So to put this debate uh, uh, in the context of the comprehensive immigration reform, what I want to say, we have been fighting for comprehensive immigration reform for many years. Mm -hmm. We have organized major events. Mm -hmm. Just to, to, to list uh, three among uh, many major events. We have organized, for instance, the Immigrant Workers Freedom Ride in 2003. We had a major rally here in New York City. More than 300 people showed up. That was in 2006. Uh, we had a major rally. We, uh, you know, we went together to Washington D.C. on March 21, uh, uh, two, uh, 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 March 21, uh, 2010. So just to show you that, uh, you know, we have been. I have. Uh, you know, I couldn't resist from bringing this T-shirt here from 2003. That, that you know, you have the list, the list of, of, of all the cities, you know, that had participated in this major rally here in Washington D.C. It was, you know, the immigrant workers' right, uh, 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 workers' freedom uh, 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 right. It was really very impressive. So uh, just to be uh, to be brief, what we would like uh, you know to see uh, in a, uh, in in the comprehensive immigration uh, reform bill, number one is racial profiling uh, should be pro prohibited and the due process should be ensured. When I talk about racial profiling, it is, it is a reality. Myself. I have been a victim of racial you know, profiling on 125 uh, at the uh, subway station on 125. It is not imagination. It is not a fiction. I am talking about you know my personal experience. Uh, and number two, uh, it is also very important to take into consideration uh, people who are on temporary, uh, who, are, uh, who have been granted temporary status. We are people who have. Uh, it been granted, uh, you know, TPS uh, or, uh, uh, withholding of, uh, you know, removal. So those people should be also included. And uh, you know, uh, lastly, uh, lastly, uh, any comprehensive immigration reform uh, should avoid uh, what I would call the uh, the legalization game. Uh, what I mean by that. Uh, in, two, in, in 1986, in 1986, the amnesty that was, uh, you know, uh, granted to undocumented people, it, it didn't cover people who arrived between 1982 and 1986. Right. Right. You know, so we we really want to avoid any legalization gap. Mm -hmm. So that is very, very important. The problem has to be resolved in a comprehensive manner. Right. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Perkins. And it's not a surprise for somebody who knows you for over the years that uh, you're the only one accepting to sponsor this bill. That's your work you've been doing with the immigration uh, community uh, in your district and in the state of New York on many other issues, many other topics, so this, this is not a surprise, and thank you very much for that. But I think uh, when uh, politicians uh, like uh, Bill, uh, President Perkins are helping, we owe them some help. 
What I call we of them some help is educate the community so that when they come to them they understand why they are introducing a bill. Uh, following what uh, our talented and very, very moving declaration of our sister, I want to link the, uh, the bill that, uh, that is being introduced with uh, the, uh, the comprehensive immigration reform. It's not just a moral thing. That's a smart thing to do. That's a huge saving for the taxpayers everywhere you go. And most people who are opposing the uh, legalization of the undocumented, they think if you do it, they will come and profit from the taxpayer money. That's quite the opposite. I will give you one example. Everybody knows it. This sister will just talk to us. Who will want to see this sister and say, I'm not going to let her contribute to the society. I'm not going to let her contribute to our community. You pay money for someone from uh, four years to 18 years to go to school, to go through high school. All that money, you throw it in the garbage and say, I don't want you here. Whoever will do that in his own family? Why the state will do that? Why they don't let them go to college and why don't they let them contribute? Even if, he, even if we talk only of taxes, they will pay back to the community. And I will go very quick for one minute to link it to the comprehensive immigration reform. You know, New York State is losing millions of dollars a year paying for Medicaid for kids of undocumented immigrants. Because these undocumented immigrants, I the ones I know from Africa, you cannot get to the US if you're not successful in your own country. They give, give only visa to people who are already successful with a lot of talents, with a lot of expertise, with a lot of things to, to contribute. When you come here, you stay undocumented. You cannot work to get insurance, health insurance for your kids. Who's paying? The taxpayer. And you, you should be able to do, to do it. You're not, you're, not, you're not paying for your kids to go to school because even if you have the money, you cannot get the documents that they need to go to, to college. You cannot get insurance even if you have the money. All that, that's a waste of money from taxpayers. So, we in the community, playing any leadership role, we have to help people like Senator Bill Perkins, telling the, the larger community that if you let these people get their documents, their kids will no longer be on the door. They will not be living on taxpayers' expenses to get their health care, to get school. Many of us, we know what it means to send our kids to school and pay for it. We did it before we come here. Our parents did it for us before we come here. So when we let them contribute, gave them the proper documents, they can set up business, hire people. Most of them are, were already successful people from their own country before they come here. Like I say, I'm not getting to the level of saying that's racist, but I know in Africa, nobody will get a US visa if you're not highly successful in your own country. Everything they tell you when you go to the consulate, they say the council is looking on for only one thing. Are you coming back? Meaning, do you have enough good situation in your own country to be back? So before you get the visa, before you come here, you were already highly successful with a lot of talent, with a lot of uh, degrees. But when you come here, you don't have your document. All you can do is job that you can, uh, you can get because that's a physical job, that's all. You can never say, this is my name, this is my degree, I was graduated from this uh, university. You cannot do it because you cannot work under your own name. And that's a waste of money for the US government, that's a waste of money for the state government, that's the waste of money for local government because these people have something to contribute in terms of finances. So we have to help them understand that. So most of the fear they have uh, will be take, uh, taken away. Thank you very much. Came from here. Unless you are a Native American, you did not come from here. So everybody here is an immigrant. So when we look at that category of people as those immigrants, it's us immigrants. We're all immigrants. So uh, please fill out the survey uh, as, as truthfully as you can and get it back to us. Um, we can entertain maybe a couple of questions. Does anybody have any questions for any of the panelists? You? Yes.
Um, this is good morning. Just to the panel, uh, I don't want you to feel like you're left out and you're like an unheard voice. I'm a community organizer from Harlem. Community Voice is heard and affiliated with Make the Road New York. So we got 80,000 plus members. Uh, first, I'd like to apologize for what the government does to you, because I'm also an Iraqi veteran, three tours. My brother's at Avro in the Seventh Fleet on Ronald Reagan. I had, wasn't aware of the treatment and how you had. Uh, the only thing I'm letting you know is uh, we're ready to mobilize on your behalf. The Dream Act will pass this year. And I have no question. And again, sorry for you know everything that you suffer, but we're gonna push ahead. Thank you. What's your name? John Dean. Okay, John. Thank you, John. Thank you for those comments. Anyone else? Any questions? All right. Let's pass it this year. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Bertha.